Welcome everybody. Today's talk is by UConn Law School's own John Kogan, so it doesn't really make much sense for me to welcome him, but I would like to just briefly introduce him by pointing out that he has spent close to 30 years thinking about health insurance, not just from the outside as a scholar, but also from the inside as a litigator and as a regulator. He helped craft the HIPAA implementing regulations. He's litigated Medicaid fraud, and he served as the general counsel for the Rhode Island um, uh, Health Insurance Commissioner for several years. So he brings really deep practical wisdom as well as scholarly chops to discussions of health insurance law and policy. And I look forward to hearing what he has to say about gender, uh, gender rating and pricing of health insurance. He asked me to ask you guys to hold your questions to the end. He says he's got about 40 minutes or so of stuff to talk about. So um, when you want to, you can raise your hands and or, or chat to me and then we'll um, take questions at the very end. Thanks, welcome, John. Thank you. So let me go ahead and, and start my uh, my uh, slides here. Okay. So um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, gender rating and health insurance, and and um, you know I'm going to talk about whether I think it's fair or unfair. He's a, a, a an advance notice. I I think it's kind of unfair. Um, so I'll get started. So um, we generally uh, we have gender rating across many lines of insurance, including health insurance, and we tend to charge women more for health insurance because, on average, women have higher medical costs. Right, the cost difference is a lot higher from the mid 20s to the mid 40s, and most of the cost difference between men and women with respect to health insurance is due to reproductive and maternity costs. So so here's here's my argument about gender rating. My argument is group classification theory for gender rating in health insurance is problematic for a number of reasons. It's got a tainted history of uh, uh, it's got a tainted history. There's not a lot of evidence supporting claims of adverse selection or moral hazard. Um, and then I turn to group equality theory. Um, insurance classification uses uh, what's called a block regarding structure. And this block regarding structure of equality can produce unaddressed cross subsidies and blocks can also involve intra block unaddressed inequalities also producing um, cross subsidies. So the theory suggests this is cap that can happen and uh, then I turn to uh, MEPS data, the medical expenditure panel survey. This is uh, data collected by uh, HHS um, and um, I use that data to show that these under there these unaddressed cross subsidies do in fact exist when we rely on gender rating in health insurance okay so there's a couple of clarifications i want to make before we get going one is i'm only addressing gender clar a, a classification in health insurance i'm not talking about any other lines or any other classification factors um, i'll use the sort of con law analogy um, in in con law um, you can you can attack a statute um, either facially or as applied. That is, facially, it's it's unconstitutional in all contexts, or as applied, it's just unconstitutional in the, this one aspect. Well, I'm using the same sort of approach. I'm making an as applied attack on gender classification and health insurance. Second, um, I'm only talking about pricing. Classification can be used for pricing, for adjusting benefits, or excluding people. From cover coverage, uh, I'm only addressing gender classification by focusing on cost or price. Okay, so here's the layout of my talk. First, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the landscape. Uh, where is it okay to use gender rating and, and where is it not okay? I'm going to talk very briefly about the evolution, the tainted evolution of gender as a pricing factor. I'm going to talk about um, how it was first came up and first was used in the 1800s in life insurance. Then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the logic of classification, why we classify risk. Again, very short, there's, there, before we started, I, I saw familiar faces out there, people who've written about classification and, and uh, price discrimination in insurance and what's fair. And I, I don't feel the need to repeat that because most everybody already knows this. Then we're gonna get into the theory and the numbers, the theory of, of, of group equality and the numbers from MEPS and then a brief conclusion. Okay, 
So first, the landscape. Where is gender rating allowed in health insurance and where is it banned? So to, before we begin, we need to sort of get a handle on the complexity of health insurance, right? So health insurance can come in many forms in many markets. Um, most people have employer-based uh, group coverage, right? Um, um, a lot of people or some people buy individual coverage. And so individual coverage, when I say individual coverage, I mean anything ranging from the kind of comprehensive coverage you get through the ACA markets uh, to policies that provide limited coverage, to policies that provide coverage for certain diseases or conditions, and even to non-insurance coverage, that is like Farm Bureau plans and health ministries. Um, there's also government programs, Medicare, Me Medicare, Medicaid, TRICARE, FEHB. And then on top of all this, there's a another layer of insurance, right? So if you have Medicare Parts A and Part, Part A and Part B, you can buy Medicare supplemental coverage, which provides additional coverage to the things that Medicare doesn't cover. If you have group or individual coverage, you can uh, get various forms of supplemental coverage, such as gap coverage to cover your high deductibles. Um, and employers offering self-funded uh, group coverage, they buy insurance to co cover some of their medical claims. Okay, so now uh, given that background, uh, if you have a handle on it, we're going to talk about gender rating and where it's prohibited by federal law. So um, in public coverage like Medicare and Medicaid, there's no premium variation based on gender. If we're talking about group coverage, uh, employer group coverage, um, you, you can't uh, charge women a different price individually uh, through group coverage. And that comes from Title VII and the Manhart case, right? If, uh, if you're talking about the small employer group market, well, the ACA, the Affordable, uh, Affordable Care Act, prohibits gender rating in the small group market. And here we're not talking about individual uh, premiums for ind individual employees. We're talking about the group premium. Small group uh, coverage is sort of a hybrid between uh, individual coverage and large group coverage. And so um, small groups are, they, they don't have their own experience rating. They, they're they mixed in with a big pool of people and their premiums used to be, uh, at, at least in many states, um, decided in part by the number of women they hired. In individual coverage, the ACA also prohibits gender rating for comprehensive plans sold in the individual market. These are the marketplace plans. And then on top of all this, the ACA has its civil rights law, section 1557, which prohibits discrimination on a number of factors, including sex um, in, in health insurance marketplaces and all plans offered by insurers that participate in those marketplaces. Of course, with all these rules, there are gonna be exceptions and qualifications. So for example, the gender rating ban in the small group market does not apply to grandfathered plans in the small group market. These were plans that were in existence when the ACA took effect. And about right now, about 15 to 20 percent of small group uh, plan uh, small groups offer grandfathered plans. Association plans are also exempt, right? These are small group small groups join these associations, and they can be priced like a large group, uh, uh, according to a Trump administration rule. Of course, that was uh, uh, struck down by a court, but it's the litigation is ongoing, it's on appeal. The individual market gender rating ban uh, doesn't apply to other types of sort of individual coverage like the short-term limited duration plans uh, that were also a product of the Trump administration. But of course there's litigation ongoing with respect to those. Uh, the individual market uh, ban doesn't apply to non-insurance insurance, right? Farm Bureau coverage, this is not considered insurance under state law, Christian Health Ministries. It also doesn't apply to non-comprehensive individual coverage, basic hospital expense coverage, medical surgical expense, hospital confinement accidents, specific disease, and gap coverage. These are, uh, whether they can gender rate or not, depends on state law. In addition, there's another qualification, which is in uh, for large group employers uh, that have a policy that is uh, that is um, fully insured. They can't gender rate individual employees, but if it's an 
a large employer with 50 to 300 people, it's likely rated using a combination of their experience and manual rates, which can include a gender component. So according to one actual estimate for Rhode Island, this can affect prices between five and 10% up and down. Um, and firms in this size cover roughly 10% of the employees in this country, over 12 million people. Now, whether this, uh, these uh, uh, manual ratings that are applied to large groups can incorporate gender rating, of course, depends on state law. Speaking of state law, I stole this uh, nice figure from uh, Abraham Logue and Schwartz. I saw Dan before I, I put up my slides. You know, it has a nice sort of display about uh, the uh, state law regarding um, use, use of gender in health insurance. There's a fair number of states that allow it. There's a fair number of states that have some limitations, but uh, allow it. And there's a few states uh, that have an outright prohibition. So most states allow at least some kind of gender rating for at least some kind of health insurance. On top of all this, we've got the layered coverage. Medigap coverage, right, covers what Medigap doesn't pay, Medicare doesn't pay for. Some Medigap plans are priced on gender, but it depends on the state, and it also depends on the carriers. Some carriers that are allowed to rate uh, Medigap by, by gender don't do so. And on top of this, there is stop-loss coverage. Uh, this is the layer of coverage that provides reimbursement to self-funded employer plans covering large claims or large overall costs. Now, this is not technically considered health insurance, but it's a critical component of self-funded employer plans. And some of his cost, like regular insurance, is passed along to employees in the form of employee contributions, right? Gender rating in stop loss is allowed in some states. Um, and interesting, it's allowed in some places where gender rating is prohibited in other health insurance, like California, right? They don't allow gender rating in their fully insured health insurance, but if you're buying stop loss coverage that's going to cover fully uh, self-funded plans, that is uh, subject to uh, price adjustment based upon gender. Okay, so what's the takeaway from all this? Gender rating is not dead, uh, but it's much harder to see. It's not allowed in most visible plan, the most visible plans, the comprehensive individual market plans. It's not allowed there, but we still see it in various forms and in group individual plans and its presence varies by market, plan type, and state. Okay, so now I'm briefly gonna talk about the evolution of gender right, uh, rating as a, a gender as a pricing factor. Um, this is gonna be very short uh, because uh, I wanna get to the end of the paper, but I just wanna give you an overview of its sort of tainted legacy in the 1800s. So uh, this part of the talk is based upon work by Mary Heen, who is at uh, Richmond Law School, and Dan Boak, who is at Colgate, he's an historian, and the various uh, uh, books and papers they've written on this. So they both talk about the development of life insurance in the United States in the late 19th and early 20th century, and they center on the history of risk. And on the one side, they both point out that risk makers began to anchor knowledge of the individual in the average or typical experience, right? Insurers accumulate data on risk in this case longevity, and use this data to price coverage. On the other hand, there is also a tendency to assess risk by other information, such as an individual social, economic, political, and historical standing, right? And the standard, the, the default standard became the affluent white male. So classifications of others were driven by things like eugenics and the dominant theory of female inferiority. So, sorry. I'm having a malfunction here, here we go. So in the 1870s, life insurance companies began to expand their market beyond their core customers, affluent Northern white males. And shortly thereafter, they started race and gender-based pricing, right? The, as I said, the white male was the standard and the baseline for pricing. Insurers used gender merged pricing for life insurance, right? Males and females were twice the same, even though they had data to show that women lived longer, they still pay the male rate. So 
women were treated either as men for pricing purposes or sometimes even as substandard risks, even though they had more favorable mortality data. And what's really interesting about this is for annuities, women were priced differently precisely because they lived longer. So they got the short end of the stick on either one. When it came to annuities, they paid a higher price. When they, uh, they, when they bought life insurance, they didn't get the better deal. African Americans were also charged a different rate based on their race. Again, men and women were priced the same, even though African American women had better mortality than African American men, right? And under some circumstances, African American women had better average mortality or had average mortality nearly compatible with that of white men, but still they played, they paid the African American rate that was applied to African American men. Even the construction of the classes for rating uh, was really suspect. And there's this nice chart in Dan Vogt's book about um, data, longevity data, based upon these factors, right? Russian, American, Italian, English, German, Negro, and Irish. Um, if you were Irish, you got a great deal, right? Because your mortality was worse than everybody else's, but yet you were considered white and rated is right, you got to pay the white rate, even you, though your mortality was worse than African-American men. So, uh, you know, uh, these while, while data played a role in this, so did a lot of other factors. So the takeaway with, from this is obviously risk classification has really tainted legacy. It was driven by data, but also by dominant social beliefs, racial and gender discrimination. All right, so next, I'm going to talk about the logic of classification, and I, I want to also keep this short. Why do we classify by uh, why do we classify risk, and why do we classify women for health insurance pricing? So, since women generally have higher health care costs, uh, it's considered fair to charge women a higher rate. Why? Insurance classification is based on the notion of actuarial fairness. And this requires that equal risks be treated equally and unequal risks be treated unequally. So when pricing is actually fair, actually fair, individuals with lower risk are charged less than they, uh, less so that they are not unfairly subsidizing those with a higher risk. So how is risk selected? Actuaries, the actual stand, standard of practice number 12 says, actuaries should select risk characteristics that are related to expected outcomes. Actual or reasonably anticipated experience should correlate with risk selection. Cause and effect doesn't have to do any doesn't doesn't have to come into play. It's desirable, but it doesn't have to be there. And rates are considered equitable or fair if differences in rates reflect material differences in expected cost. Okay. So there are also efficiency considerations. In addition to classifying according to these costs, there are efficiency considerations, right? We wanna avoid, avoid adverse selection and we can classify to do that, right? We wanna avoid, for some reason, I'm having trouble controlling my slides, moral hazard and risk classification can incentivize policyholders uh, to take care to limit future claims. So we can use it uh, risk classification to address moral hazard concerns. And again, subsidies, we want, uh, you know, unclassified premiums can force low risk policyholders to cross subsidize high risk policyholders. And this makes it, uh, makes the less risky, less likely per to purchase insurance in the first place. So the takeaway from this is fairness in classification is linked, uh, it link with, uh, deals with linking price with risk. We want to avoid cross subsidies between different classes of risk. And there are efficiency concerns, uh, especially adverse selection and moral hazard. So with all that behind us, let's turn to the empirical evidence, the theory and the cost data related to gender rating. So there's four points I wanna make here. First, there's little evidence of adverse selection in health insurance based upon gender. Second, there's little evidence that women are a moral hazard in health insurance. Third, theory and structure of group-based uh, equality tells us that there may be intra, inter and intra cross subsidies that are simply not addressed. And then the MEPS data, the medical expenditure panel survey data, suggests that these cross subsidies do in fact exist, 
that they are significant and they are for characteristics that are not typically used in health insurance pricing. So what does this mean? It means that gender rating is, is, um, is, may not be needed for efficiency reasons. And as a practical matter, it doesn't make rates fair. Okay, that's, so that's the big takeaway. Let's talk about these points individually. First, the empirical evidence on efficiency concerns. So look, there's a lot of fear of adverse selection in insurance. Um, I love there was a lot of fear when the ACA was coming in that there was a lot of adverse selection insurance. Uh, people thought especially that gender could be a big driver of adverse selection uh, unisex rating in the ACA. Um, so with just generally, there's um, you know empirical research uh, by somebody who's you know hosting this talk that suggests that you know adverse selection we we fear adverse selection, but it's not as bad as we think. And in fact, there are markets that demonstrate adverse selection and others that do not. It's not a universal principle in health insurance. There is, however, evidence of adverse selection in health insurance, right? But is gender-based adverse selection actually happening? Well, there's not really a lot of evidence that it is happening, right? There's a recent study from Germany uh, after the EU imposed unisex insurance pricing, more women switched from social health insurance where there wasn't uh, gender pricing to private health insurance where there had been gender pricing. Um, more women switched from uh, the social insurance to the private insurance on men once the price for women dropped. What does this, this suggest? There might be some adverse selection, but there's a lot missing from this article, especially why the women were uh, switching. Obviously they're sensitive to price, but we don't know who they were, what their risk was, whether they were getting, uh, you know, covering more benefits or why they were switching, we really don't know a whole lot and the article really doesn't provide it. So it is suggestive that there may be adverse selection, but it's not particularly convincing. And really that's honestly the only thing I found. What about moral hazard? Um, what about moral hazard? Is there any evidence uh, of moral hazard uh, is different for women than men? Well, there's not much here either. I, I found this uh, recent study from 2000. It finds a statistically insignificant difference in moral hazard between men and women. But I, I don't, I, I, you know, this is a small study, four months of inpatient data from a single hospital in Croatia. I'm sorry, I, I, I don't think it tells me a whole lot of anything. So there may be a lot of fear, but there's not a lot of evidence either way on adverse selection or moral hazard in health insurance based on gender. So absent like internal insurer evidence, like they may have evidence in their own data that's suggested, but absent you know, internal evidence that insurers have are keeping to themselves, there's not a lot of support for classification based on gender to address you know, these efficiency issues. So let's turn to the group, group equality theory and the cost data to explore the issue of cross subsidies. So in a non-uniform society like our society, we have a lot of differences. There are gonna be rival classes, right? Which compel choices about equality. And these choices, uh, choices that are not made by health insurers when they use gender rating. They pick gender as a way of establishing equality and not these other choices. So to, as a sort of background or explanation about what I'm talking about, where I get this from, uh, I'm relying on uh, a book, uh, an oldie but a goodie, uh, uh, Douglas Ray's book, Equalities, which sets out two basic structures of group equality, segmental equality and block regarding equality. So a segmental structure of equality requires equality for all present within a particular class. For example, we have two classes here, class X and class Y. And class X has A, B, and C, and class Y has D, E, and F. Segmental equality requires equality among A, B, and C, and equality among D, E, and F, but not equality across A, D, B, E, or C, F. So we have equality within classes, but not across classes. And so what we have is individual based equality within each class, but systematic equality across classes. So when we're talking about risk classification insurance, we might think we are talking about segmental equality, 
for example, class X is women and class Y is men. But risk selection is not segmental equality. Risk is not equalized within categories. Instead, risk classification relies on block regarding equality. So block regarding equality requires two features. Uh, the subjects of equality are divided in two or more classes, and equality is required between classes, but not within them. So no individual in any block needs to be treated equally to any other, but the two blocks are treated equally. So here's an example of block regarding equality. We have two different classes, A and B. So in these two classes, none of U, V, W, X, Y, and Z need to be equal to any other individual, either within a class or across a class. However, A and B have some measure of equality, right? So in a risk classification system, A and B are treated equally for the purposes of risk. They bear their own risk. But there are two difficulties with block regarding equalities. The first is what uh, Doug Ray calls the pinwheel effect. If there is a single characteristic to divide a population, for example, C1, we can satisfy the requirement of equality for one characteristic, C1, by dividing based on that set of inequalities. So, for example, men and women, right? This is an example of gender-based uh, rating, gender-based classification. But if there are a number of cross-culling cleavages, C1, C2, and C3, we can still satisfy the requirement for the one class, C1, by dividing based on that, that line. But if we start to view the diagram through the lens of the other inequalities, the first dividing line doesn't solve for inequalities across these other classes, right? So if we have men and women and black and white and married and single, the, the one line we use to divide C1 doesn't solve for the other inequalities. So the, the model that uh, Ray describes says that this is a possibility in, in group-based equality. Using data from MEPS, we can see how these potential cross-cutting equalities play out in gender rating. Classifying by gender and ignoring these other inequalities means that there are unaddressed cross-subsidies, and MEPS data tells us that these cross-subsidies are not insubstantial. But there's another issue, intersectional cross-subsidies. Um, because block regarding equality structure does not concern itself with inequalities within a class, there will be cross subsidies within each class. This is normally expected within classes that a homogeneous class will have internal cross subsidies based on a random distribution of risk. But to the extent that other classes are not considered, there is another type of cross, uh, cross subsidy. If uh, Kimberly Crenshaw was here and did insurance, she would call this intersectional cross subsidies, right? Uh, for example, based on race. So the odd thing about this particular finding is that we don't allow racial classifications, right? They're socially unacceptable. In some cases, as, as Dan and his co-authors point out, they're explicitly illegal. But this doesn't eliminate or even address the racial cross subsidies. And MEPS data suggests that if health insurance risk is classified by gender and gender alone, white women in the, in the female classification will be heavily subsidized by Asian, Black, and Hispanic women. All right, so let's, so let's look at the data. First, I've, I've talked about MEPS. I, I want to tell you what it is. It's a medical expenditure panel survey. It's a large-scale annual survey of families and individuals and medical providers and employers across the United States. It's one of the most complete sources of data on cost um, and the use of healthcare and insurance coverage. I'm going to be using figures from 2015. I, I'm happy to explain why afterwards. It would take too long of an explanation now. Um, and the figures from 2015 are mean expenditures um, for adults who had private insurance at some time in 2015. And these expenditures are only the expenditures by the primary private insurer, right? So I'm trying to model as, you know, replicate as close as I can 
the data that insurance companies would have when they're making their when when they're going to make their classifications. All right, let's look at gender. So on the left hand side, uh, I have um, the at the mean cost for women and for men from 18 to 64 for private health insurance in 2015. And the mean cost for women is uh, $4,216. And the mean cost for men is $2,638. So what this means is on average, women spend 60% more than men with respect to healthcare costs. If we narrow this, Jack, I, Jack wants a cookie. Jack, can you, you, um, thank you. I am so sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, women and men. Okay. Um, in the, it, so it, the, the first set of data on the left is 1864 year adult life until you reach Medicare. If we narrow this down to that mid 20s to mid 40s where the costs are highest, we see that the average cost for women is a little, little over 3,400 bucks. And for men, it's a little over 1,500 bucks. And women's, women's spending is 120% higher. So it's really a big a gap there. But overall, it's about 60% higher for the whole, the whole age range. Um, hang on a second. Okay. So, what about another factor, right? What there are plenty of other factors we can use to rate people, uh, for classify people for pricing. So let's look at educational attainment. All right. So educational attainment, how much school you've had, the data shows that uh, that people who have at, had at least some college, their average cost per year are thirty six hundred seventeen dollars. All right. Um, for people who have a high school diploma, it's $3,369. And people with less than a high school diploma, it's $1,852. What this means is the people at the lowest end of the scale, uh, the people at the highest end of the scale, the people with college degrees, spend 95% higher, uh, have 95% higher spending than people with at least, uh, that says some college, with less than a high school diploma. But People with a high school diploma is a small part of the population, somewhere between 10 to 50%. If we simply merge that into the category above, we still have 20% higher spending. It's still a significant amount of spending higher based on education. So people with less education are subsidizing people with higher education. So educational attainment versus gender as a rating factor. Well, to the extent that gender is used instead of educational attainment, the cross subsidies to higher educated insureds are ignored, right? Maybe that's okay. Maybe we don't care about this, but it suggests that a premium subject to gender rating may be fair with respect to one factor gender, but not fair with respect to at least one other factor, which is education. But educational attainment isn't the only possible alternative class we can rate health insurance on. What about marriage, right? Well, 18 to 64, married people, 37.79. Non-married, 29.42. Uh, married people spend 60% more on health coverage than unmarried people. Now, you may look at this and say, well, married people are having babies. So maybe in that mid-range, you know, there are women having babies and that's jacking up the cost. No, it, that's actually not the issue. It's really kind of weird. When you get to the mid 20s to mid 40s, it flattens out. So when you have um, gender rating, it bows up in the mid 20s to mid 40s and then goes down. With with marriage, it sort of stays flat and then jumps as you get older, right? So the ratio is one to one, 25 to 44, but overall it's 1.6 to one, and the costs are the same for men and women, married and non-married. Okay. Here's my favorite, race and ethnicity. Now, I'm not suggesting that we start rating by race and ethnicity, but I think to the extent that people self-identify using these categories and the data is there, it gives us something really interesting to think about when we're thinking about gender rating. All right, 
So race and ethnicity by 18 to 64, whites pay 38, 38, blacks 31, 91, Asian 23, 23, Hispanic 22, 57. The ratio is, is 1.7 to one. Whites have 70% higher spending than Hispanics. If we narrow it down to 25 to 44, uh, Asians are on top. I think this is an anomaly for 2015. I've seen data from other years where um, it, it follows the pattern white, black, Asian, and Hispanic. So if we cut that out, we just look at the difference between white and Hispanic, it's still 20% higher by whites than Hispanics. So what does this tell us? There are a lot of cross subsidies that are not accounted for and are in fact ignored when you just rate by gender. And the cost difference ratios of the non-use classes are in some cases substantial. Um, in some cases, they are as high as the cost difference ratio for gender. Again, gender may be, uh, red gender rating, rating may be fair for gender, but unfair for numerous other classes that show high cost differences. But is gender rating actually fair with respect to gender? Oh, my Kimberly Crenshaw slide is gone. So let's talk about intersectionality, an analytic framework for understanding how aspects of a person's social and political identities combine to create different modes of discrimination and privilege, right? Intersectionality theory asserts that people are often disadvantaged by multiple identity markers. Okay, so what that suggests is maybe when we look at gender, we look at identity markers like race in the female gender pool, right? And here it is. If we look at women and race, what are the spending differences? White women, 4820, black women, 3247, Asian women, 3061, and Hispanic women, 2845. There's 70% higher spending by white women than Hispanic women. What's the translation? This ain't fair. This ain't fair with respect to gender. So my conclusion, there is good reason to get rid of gender rating, right? Insurance classification by gender has a troubled history. There's little evidence that we need to impose gender rating to address adverse selection and moral hazard problems. The traditional use of gender rating and the failure uh, to use other meaningful factors to rate health insurance suggests that gender rating is simply not fair. Okay, this of course doesn't raise, it doesn't address the other issues I've raised, which is, well, what do we do about all these cross subsidies, like those based on race, um, and health insurance. And um, I don't have an answer for that. Um, I need to think about that some more. My main point here was to try to address whether uh, gender rating is fair. And by all accounts and by, by my analysis, I think it's really unfair. And I think, uh, I think we ought to get rid of it across the board. All right, so that's it. Um, I thought it'd take about 40 minutes and I was pretty close, let me, stop my slideshow great and, so and I, I will take questions all right I'll, I'll be the moderator and i saw omri's hand first and then dan schwartz and uh we'll take take it from there you can welcome to chat me or just raise your hand if you want yes hi, can josh, you hear me? josh is next yes yeah great uh, th thank you for the for the uh, data and for the presentation but i must say that the conclusion i think you can draw from these uh, from this concern that you raised and showed us with the data about Cross subsidies is not that gender rating should be eliminated, but that it sh rating should be compounded by all these other factors that uh, also that as to avoid the cross subsidy. Now, unlike this intersectionality worry that you had when you showed us the spinning wheel, so we, you have your if you uh, where you can only cut one way. When you rate, you obviously know you can rate along numerous uh, uh, classifications and numerous individual factors. Um, and you don't even have to use suspect classifications because the underlying reasons that, can, uh, that people have different expected expenditures 
uh, depend on various other factors that can be identified. So all we need to do is estimate a model about the factors, let's say the top 50 factors that matter to predict people's expenditures, in which probably gender and race could have a small weight, or I don't know what it would be. You can eliminate, if you're uncomfortable with race or gender or other suspect classification, and eliminate them, and they will be picked by other uh, uh, proxy factors. But if your goal is, and what troubles you is um, cross subsidies, then what you should advocate for is a classification on steroids, personalized rating. <laughs> right, right. No, I, I, this, ha this was uh, as I was working on this paper. Um, I, I, uh, and this is the paper is still in the works. Um, this occurred to me and occurred to me like I'm making this argument, not that we should get rid of these things, but we should start chopping this up into smaller and smaller pieces. And I need that's a that's a, 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 a great observation. And I really need to sort of work through that. I, I don't have a response to that other than this occurred to me and this is something I need to work on. But it's a great point. Like I, I start pointing out all these things where we can chop it up and it's it, these are meaningful ways to do it. Um, uh, why don't we just start, as you said, you know, rating on steroids? Go. Okay, Dan is next. Uh, Dan, Hi, Dan. go ahead. The floor is Hi, John. How are you? I'm I'm good. Good, good. Uh, so I enjoyed this presentation. Thanks. I have a few different questions. Um, mm -hmm. So my first question has to go with. It has to do with the relevance of the data, um, because to what extent is it possible that some of the data about expenditures reflects insurance rates? I mean, for instance, you know, if African Americans have less insurance, they're less likely to actually uh, be spending on care, and so it might be hard to sort of say that the data reflects different cost expenditures we would expect among people with insurance if you're not taking that into account. So I just didn't know if, if you were taking that into account, if the data was for all people who have insurance or not. Um, so this is, this is all private insurance, right? And there is a way using MEP data to look at people by income. It's kind of rough, um, but at one point, I don't have this in the slide, but I did look at I considered this and I was like, well, if there's an income difference, um, they're gonna buy maybe some people with an income difference gonna buy less insurance. So what I looked at is I broke the data up uh, according to sort of middle and high income. So I cut out uh, a lower income people and the results based on race were, were pretty much the same. They weren't as stark, but the differences were still the same. Now that doesn't mean that there isn't a difference uh, in, insurance that's purchased or it doesn't fully account for um, for income differences. The the way that you can divide it using MEPS is, is kind of rough, but I did do that and there's still a difference based on race. Yeah, great. Okay, so two other quick questions. Yeah. The, the second question, um, and, and by the way, that, that helps a lot. That totally answers the, the question, I think. Um, so the second question I had, I didn't totally, I wasn't sure I totally followed why moral hazard might even be a justification for charging uh, different rates so, because yeah, I, well, I, threw, like... I threw that in just because um, uh, I threw that in just as because I wanted to do, give a general talk about um, about classification and some of the concerns in general about classification and then but I wanted to come around and say look I, I don't think there's not a lot of evidence that moral hazard is is a is a problem here. but in general i would say it's not really relevant because you know that, that that's only relevance to the extent that you're charging people based on their decisions but like people don't make right sense what gender they I, are. I know i mean there, there is there basic. is the you know the the jelly donut argument i've i've got i've got insurance so i'm gonna smoke more and eat more jelly donuts. yeah but but i i don't think there's a lot of evidence for for that kind of moral hazard in, in insurance. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the third point, and this is a more general fairness point that I've often thought of, and I think so, is that you didn't raise, but I wonder if you might want to think about, it, which is, I think a pretty strong argument for not charging more for health insurance to women is that a lot of it has to do with 
childbearing and, and so forth, which is a general positive externality for society and a, a benefit for men as well as women. And so, uh, 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 or a cost, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but a lot of it actually has to do with, um, you, you know, actually those are, those are benefits that, that maybe we want to encourage. So I, you know, it seems to me like the, the positive, like that is sort of a unique element of this that might be worth addressing right. in terms of a fairness concern. Right. In, and I, I do address that in my paper. I, I go, uh, I have a longer explanation about the arguments that people make uh, for and, you know, for and against gender rating. And certainly that's one of them that, that, you know, babies are good. Like we want people, to, like who's gonna pay for my medic, who's gonna pay into the Medicare trust fund, you know, when I'm collecting from it? Well, my kids, like your kids, right? So we want kids, right? And and um, and the other argument is, you know, women, uh, we allocate all the costs, the maternity costs to women, but like, you know, my wife had two kids and I, I can tell you, I, I don't wanna turn this into a, from a PG to an R rated uh, presentation, but you know, she didn't make them herself. Right, so so that's another reason why all these costs shouldn't be allocated to women, and the extent that we do, we shouldn't we shouldn't condemn them, or we shouldn't penalize them for it by charging them higher health insurance. So in my paper, I I have a longer explanation of that. The main talk today is I wanted to get into that into that data about you know that that was really what I wanted to talk about today. But thank you, thank you. Uh, Josh Teitelbaum is next on the line, and that's all we got at the moment. So feel free to raise your hand if you want to come in. All right, thanks, thanks, John. This I'm. I hope you can hear me. I can. Uh, yeah, great. I'm. A, I really enjoyed this talk, and I uh, I learned a lot from that that uh, the presentation of the the data set. Um, I, let me just. I'll start by. I want to double down on Omri's comment. Um, you know. The, the way you present things, it's, you seem to be making a, a strong case for, yeah. as he said, sort of classification on steroids. And so if you, if you want to come to a different conclusion, you've got to think about how you're marshalling this yeah. evidence. Yeah. Um, like right. Dan's last right. point was very strong, and I'm glad to hear you, you, you addressed that in the paper, right? That's a very strong reason yeah. for, you know, against uh, gender classification, but but the cross subsidy point and the intersectionality points seem really seem to push the other way. So I do think you yeah. need to think that, think about that more. Okay. And I, I also want to say that and I agree with that. I, I, oh, I, I, can I ask you why, why does the intersectionality point go the other way? Um, because if, if we're rating based on class, I mean, based on uh, gender, mm -hmm. and it turns out it's really not, it's really not fair to do that because of all these classes in there. Why is that an argument against not, unless I misunderstood you, um, why is it, I would think that's a pretty strong argument for getting rid of, of gender because it, 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 you know, it doesn't address these, these subsidies or am I missing your point? It, it seems to me- you're shaking his head. <laughs> it seemed to me you were arguing that um, when we, if we allow for gender classification, um, that just that doesn't solve the uh, the other uh, cross subsidies. Oh, you're that, saying that right. we should. Okay, I see. You're saying that. And, that, and I agree. It doesn't we solve do all those these other, other things, right? Okay. So we like ought to solve the conclusion that, that okay, therefore you shouldn't do doesn't necessarily follow. Okay, got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. But the the last thing I wanted to say about adverse selection was I, I wasn't fully convinced. Uh, again, with sort of the the path of the argument. So you said there's this there's this theoretical case for adverse selection if you don't allow an insurer to classify based on some observable characteristic that could be correlated or that is, you know, demonstrably correlated with risk, right? And so theoretically you you would you could expect that there could be adverse selection problems if you ban classification based on that characteristic. And then you said, but there really isn't evidence in favor of that. And you said you really only found one study on point that that provided evidence that was at least consistent with that, even if it wasn't, you know, an ironclad case. Mm -hmm. And so that this absence of evidence, you then take to say, well, so that means we don't have to worry about adverse selection. But I, I'm not sure I agree. 
if there's a strong theoretical case to worry about adverse selection and with an absence of empirical evidence, it seems that your prior would be, I have to worry about adverse selection. And the only study, the only evidence you could find didn't reverse that prior, right? Didn't go against that prior. So I'm just wondering, you know, it, I'm questioning the strength of that move. Yeah, I I, I get that. And, uh, but I, I take the view that, look, there's been a lot of worry about adverse selection based on gender. Lots of talk about it. I, I would have figured if, if there was a, so this much concern and we have a lot of data out there and we went, you know, we, the ACA switched, the, the EU, EU switched, I would think that there's be something more than one study that sort of suggests, but doesn't really confirm, sort of dances around it a little bit. I would think that there would be more out there. And so I view the absence of evidence suggesting that there is giving more, me more uh, evidence of adverse selection. I take that absence as meaning something. Um, you know, I'm, I'm less concerned about the theory here. Um, I, a lot of people worry about it, but at lacking evidence, it's hard for me to say, I think you're right. I, I should probably not completely di dismiss it, but I think, I think I'm not convinced that it, it is a real problem. So. Okay, Walter Welsh is up next. Walter. Oh, thank you for the talk. I'm uh, Hi, Walter. Just, I don't know if you've thought about this. Uh, I, I teach on uh, life insurance, which has obviously gender as a key as a factor in the mm -hmm. underwriting for life insurance. Did you think about this and uh, listen to your comments on health insurance? Did you think about the gender issues for life insurance at all? I, I did, um, but I made clear, like, I, I think I think health insurance is I'm just I'm just looking at health insurance. I know that in life insurance there is a lot of concern about adverse selection, um, um, and I know yeah. it's it's a big rating factor. I I I made clear at the beginning that I'm just talking about health insurance, but I I know that it it, it is a, a, a important consideration in life insurance. Yeah, uh, and it, it, in some cases that's the only information the insurer has is or is the age and mortality table. Sometimes there's health, but sometimes that's all they're using. I did ask some insurers, given the issues we're thinking about today, how do you look at an application where somebody identifies as one gender or another? Are you making any look at that as to you know, gender at birth or gender? And, and I don't think, and this is strictly an anecdotal response, I don't think there's any effort to distinguish a person identifies or fills out the application uh, with a gender, that's what they use. They don't go any further than that. And I'm not sure there would be much difference when you look at the whole group that they're insuring it. So it would be of any value or any that would be wrong for the insurer to do that. So they just take the gender identification on the application and go from there. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, uh, Tom Magnuson, you're next. Yeah, this is more um, to the point of uh, what Omri said, uh, uh, which is, it, it seems that this is, the problem could be a data a lack of data problem more than a wanting to exclude uh, data, you know, because I, I think of it as a practical sense, insurers for a long time only had, you know, male, female, or only had race. It, do you think it's something that would be resolved if we were able to aggregate more specifics on more categories of various risks to actually figure out what the underlying risks are? So my, a point that I made was you may have an average lifespan of, you know, 70 years, but your scattering could be enormous. And, because, and that's because the underlying reasons are, well, people of such and such die really young or people of such and such are able to live a long time or have fewer health effects. Um, I, I just didn't know if, because uh, I think this is more of getting rid of the category, but should the push be more to add more categories yeah. of risk? That's my question. Right. right. Yeah, I, I, I think going back to Omri's point and raised by, uh, uh, Joshua and uh, several other people. I, I, I think it's an excellent point. It's one I'm really going to have to consider uh, because uh, because uh, I, I think I think enough people have uh, made it clear to me that that the argument doesn't necessarily completely flow from from this. I need I re need re need to rethink this. 
So, John, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, some other things that you didn't talk about, although they were kind of, you know, they were touched on a little, a little by some of the other questions. One thing about gender is it's not, it's not strictly immutable, and we now think of it as more mutable than we used to think about it. But, I mean, as opposed to Irish, say, I mean, anybody can say they're Irish. Uh, there's a joke that my grandmother used to tell about somebody who went in to change her name from Schwartz to McCluskey to O'Brien because she said people were going to, if she changed her name to McCluskey, people would say, what was your name before it was McCluskey? Um, so she, <laughs> she needed to change it twice uh, so she could respond McCluskey when they asked her. Um, so, you know, gender is, of course, not fixed and, you know, people do change gender, but not very many. Um, and so that's one nice thing. It has all kinds of desirable properties from an insurance perspective that you can't game it and stuff like that. Um, I also wanted to second Josh's point about moral hazard. I just don't see how there's a moral hazard problem with gender. Okay. Um, it, unless, you, unless you're prepared to argue that somehow women are more insurance sensitive than men. So if we don't rate them separately, they're more, more likely to uh, you know, carry on risky behaviors. Uh, it just doesn't seem plausible to me uh, at all. So. Comment. Um, yeah, I, I, again, I, I, I have to confess the the moral hazard. Uh, I, I put in there because it was a general discussion, and then I looked around and I, I found this kind of ridiculous article about Croatia, and and so I, I just put it in there because that's the issue it addressed. But um, I, I take your point. Um, the the issue of immutability and a characteristic, I, I think it's important to some extent, but the extent that health insurance is um, rated on a yearly basis, and to the extent that insurers can ask a lot of questions and have in the past, even for employer-based insurance, they ask a lot of questions. Um, um, I, don't, I don't know that having other less sort of immutable characteristics uh, as rating factors is sort of out of the question. Other insurers do it like, so the characters that are used are used in other lines, right? Education and marriage are used in, in uh, auto insurance, right? So, so I'm, I'm not so sure that it makes a difference that they're not sort of immutable. Is, is that your point or? Yeah. I, no, that's yeah. a good, that's a, that's a good comeback is that it, it's, you know, we, we, we use it and it, it does its job somewhere else. So we could use it here if we want to do. I do think you do have to come to terms with Omri's opening question, which is kind of going to be mine too, which is yep. like, okay, maybe you just made the case for a ton of classification yeah. and maybe you want to, maybe you want to, maybe it's like saying, yeah. no, 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 I really do believe in this. There's an interesting literature that's very theoretical that I think doesn't actually come up with any crisp results about sort of optimal classification in insurance and how many, how many boxes should we create? And the answer is like, God, it depends on 50,000 different things that we can't measure, you know, risk aversion and, and and heterogeneity of characteristics and stuff. So it's practically just not going to help you out very much, but you could you could gesture towards that anyway and say that we don't yeah. really have a good theory about that from an economics perspective. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's 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 a it's a good point. All right. Looks like we're coming on to five o'clock. Uh anybody else want to get a last question in while we still got John? I'm I'm happy to stay afterwards as well. Okay. Uh, so yeah, this, I will this, this is an we're an early, you know, this 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 is an early work. So I'm I'm delighted to take a, as many comments as, and suggestions as, as you have. Great. I don't see anybody else's hand up. If I've missed, uh, let me well, I just have right. another another comment. Uh, oh, great, Tom. Sorry. It, it was just Please. actually almost in in like argument against what I just said before, which is, I mean, could the argument also be that? What you're oh. saying, I'm not actually on video. I'll put myself on video. Oh, okay. Um, so the argument also be that what you're saying is, in the absence of more categories, until we've achieved that data, gender shouldn't be used because it's so, um, we'll say, inaccurate in determining risk potentially. Um, yeah, I, that was just something I, else that I thought about as well. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I think I have to, I have to come up with a better. If I'm going to use this data and make these claims, I have to go come up with a better, better result. Um, and, and that that's one, I think, one possible way of getting there. Um, but, but I need to think about this more. And, and so these comments are super helpful.
All right, Thank we're you. at five o'clock. Anyone who wants to stick around can do so. I'm going to, but you're also welcome to leave. Thank you all for coming. Thanks. And let's join us. Join me in thanking John. Bravo. All right.